Hi, I'm Zach Katzman. We're doing our project on basketball, the different aspects, including current events, governance structure, commercialization, and history. And to tell you a little more about that, here's Claude. Dr. James Nismith is the creator of basketball. Um, he's originally from Canada, but was working at an YMCA in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, in 1891 of December, he created this game for his students, obviously in the winter time. Um, he created 13 original rules of the game. He started uh, using peach cups nailed to 10 foot poles in the gym, which were soon replaced by Tony Hinkle's symmetrical orange, very bouncy ball in the 1950s. But originally, uh, American footballs were used. Basketball spread very easily throughout women's leagues and throughout the U.S. because it's need for very simple equipment um, and just people on a basketball. In 1898, the NBL was created, National Basketball League, which was later replaced by the NBA. On February 19, or February 9, 1895, the first college game was played. Throughout the 1920s, there was uh, very little organization of professional leagues uh, throughout the USA. But throughout the 1950s, basketball developed into a major college sport, which only helped increase more interest in the pros. But by the 1970s, there was not a lot of interest. There wasn't a lot of skilled players, so um, ticket sales were decreasing um, and revenues were declining. But in 1979, uh, two uh, of the most famous players of all time, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, faced off in, the, in their college careers. Uh, but spectators couldn't help but follow these two guys throughout their NBA careers because they were so incredible and very skilled. Uh, in 1980, or the 1980s decade, Isaiah Thomas and Dennis Radman um, led the show, uh, also two of the most famous players. And then by the 1990s, uh, this was probably the most important decade for basketball's history. Um, Michael Jordan, all of us know Michael Jordan, took, took control, uh, increased the sporting commercialization uh, by releasing products, you know, Air Jordans, um, and increasing marketing and commercials just in general. Um, currently, the NBA leaders are Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Chris Paul, and Ray Allen. Over the past years, basketball has com become as commercialized as any other sport out there. Um, but the economic standing of the individual teams is a bit different to the league as a whole. Over this past year, one-third of NBA teams uh, took a loss, um, the biggest being the Denver Nuggets at 26.3 million. On the opposite end of the spectrum, big, smaller city or larger cities such as the LA Lakers and the New York Knicks uh, generated operating incomes of 26.3 and 48.79 million dollars, respectively. And from a revenue standpoint, there's a huge spread, with the highest team being the New York Knicks at 208 million, and the least being the Oklahoma City Thunder at 82 million. And the issue with that is the larger teams have the money to go out and spend on the bigger name stars, which put fans in the seats and generate more money for the teams themselves. While the smaller market teams, such as Portland and Milwaukee, have a much more difficult time building their team up and have to do so through the NBA draft, not signing through free agency. Uh, one of the most recent examples of that was LeBron James leaving his hometown of Cleveland, Ohio to go to Miami where he could team up with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. And there was much more endorsement incentives there and much more of a chance for him to market himself as a brand. And although he was going to take a pay cut, reportedly Nike offered him $100 million alone just to play in New York City. So there was definitely some incentive outside from endorsers. Uh, from endorsements to go to a larger city where he could be um, used more as like a brand rather than just focus on his contract for him to make money. And um, the problem with that is it all, well, we talked about earlier, it doesn't give smaller market teams much of a chance. And uh, this also is reflected through ticket sales with the highest ticket sale, average tickets being $117.45 for the New York Knicks which is nearly five times as much as the Memphis Grizzlies, a team that went even farther than them in the playoffs last year, which cost an average of $22.95. So 
So it really can't come as much of a surprise when 10 out of the 30 teams in the league create a uh, loss each year. So the owners are trying to uh, desperately do something to make up for that. The rules of basketball have changed a lot over time, mostly in favor of basketball fans and commercialization. Some of the rules that have been manipulated um, to contribute to this are, one, the increased length of time of games, which allows for more stoppage time in between plays, in turn leading to more commercials and media attention. The second one is media timeouts, which occur at the first dead ball with six minutes left to play and with three minutes left to play in each quarter. Uh, the third one is shot clocks, which allows for suspense of all viewers. It keeps the action of the sport going um, and allows media to capture these really intense moments and then replay them later for interest. Uh, the fourth one is the five second rule, which forces the offense to make a forward moving action to for the basket after the defender has come within a certain distance to them. Um, that again keeps the action moving and the spur going. Uh, the format of basketball throughout the United States of America begins with our um, national basketball team, the U.S. national team. Um, and then our professional league mentioned before is the uh, NBA. The current commissioner of the NBA is a man named David Stern and he's been commissioning since 1984. This season featured 76 players, international players from 31 different countries, which really shows um, how globalized the sport has become. While players range from all around the world, there's not many coaches that um, in the NBA that coach or are international coaches. Continuing on, regarding the 2011 lockout, David Stern, um, as mentioned before, is the commissioner and represented the NBA organization. Uh, Derek Fisher of the Los Angeles Lakers took the position of the president of the Players Union. Um, and Billy Hunter is not a player, but he represent, represented all the players from a negotiating standpoint. Um, Zach will talk about uh, the NBA lockout in much more detail in a second. In general, the NBA represents a true profit-maximizing league. Um, it's demonstrated in the way the NBA is run and the action of the players. Owners want money and players want money as well. Um, so people aren't driven um, anywhere near, like for example, in European sports, uh, teams are much more focused on winning um, and getting the most utility out of what they do. Um, furthermore, the after the NBA, uh, as for the system of basketball in the United States, uh, there's the NBA Development League uh, and then there's collegiate leagues uh, state programs, and then obviously community and amateur programs as well. Um, over the past year, there have been two dominating headlines in the basketball world, um, that being the NBA lockout and whether the topic of whether college players should be paid uh, to play. And the NBA lockout uh, began in the summer months and really was a dominating topic on ESPN and every other uh, sport, sporting news channel. And the season was cut from an 82 to a 66 game season and uh, because of the fact that owners were losing so much money. And it was reported that they were losing $300 million um, each year and wanted the player contracts to be cut um, up to 40% in order uh, to make up for that and also reduce spending uh, on player contracts for, to $45 million each year as well. Um, the players were looking to keep the 2005 collective bargaining agreement intact, in which they receive 53% of all basketball-related revenue, which includes um, ticket sales, concessions, uh, merchandise, and uh, TV contracts as well. Um, an agreement was finally reached where um, they agreed upon a 50-50 split um, of all revenue, and uh, which amounts to a $3 billion gain for the owners over the next 10 years, which is the lifespan of the contract and the players could make anywhere from 49 to 51% of this revenue depending on whether um, the NBA exceeds or falls short of its uh, annual projections. Um, on the topic of whether college players should be uh, paid, um, each season college basketball players at top schools go out and generate all types of revenue through merchandise, ticket sales, pretty much every aspect and make these schools a ton of money and are only awarded a scholarship um, for doing so. Uh, 
Um, many of these players um, are only trying to be in school for one year and then move on to the NBA and are usually just using this as a stepping stool because of the rules in place where you have to be 19 and one year removed from high school to qualify for the NBA draft. Uh, the process has been highly scrutinized and uh, for various reasons, including compromising the integrity of these schools, which it's kind of been made a joke to bring these players in and take spots of kids who are trying to get an education and these players are only trying to stay for one year and really don't care about any of the academic academics that go along with attending the university. Um, on the other side, these athletes are being, careers are being put at risk and there's millions of dollars on the line for them where if they sustain a career ending injury that really could be and put an end to any hopes they had of supporting their family or making a career out of uh, playing basketball. So there's really a ton of scrutiny that this process is uh, undertaking from both the NBA forcing players to go as well as colleges taking these players in. So the process will undoubtedly change and uh, it'll be interesting to see how it does so in the future.